Good morning, everyone at Shiloh Ranch. Whether you're online, you're in Wickenburg, you're at home, whatever, we're so glad you decided to join us this morning. Hope everyone had a fantastic Thanksgiving full of good food and great people and great football. Go Beavs! (laughs) (laughs) Did, Did something go good for the Beavers? The Beavers won. They won. And this only happens once every 10 or so years. No, I'm just kidding. Um... Anyways, thanks for being here. Thanks for commenting, saying where you're watching from. Thanks for sharing. Robert, how was your Thanksgiving? It was excellent. We excellent. went to Idaho, spent it oh. with uh, our in-laws. There's, it had a great time. It was short, but very uh, fantastic. And I hope everybody out there, you know, made, you know, the best of all you can be. Yeah. You just be your, just go be yourselves and uh, enjoy and, and uh, put our faith in, in, in the Lord yeah. in this time. Yeah. So anyways, George, Str- I mean, um, Robert, <laughs> Jordan always makes that joke. Funny, funny, Mary. <laughs> funny. If you could, as a leadership team rem- member, because remember, uh, we have introduced these leadership team members, and I'm going to say it every single time we talk to one of them, uh, these are the faces you should remember and, and reach out and ask questions or ask for help, whatever. As a leadership team member, can you kind of talk about, obviously, uh, we're not in person this week, maybe what that's going to look, or as much as you can share what that's going to look like maybe some encouragement um all those thoughts what's what's on well, your mind w- yeah we just we know that our online presence is is uh, having a huge impact during this time uh we thank i think all of you here in this group this small group here this morning that yeah. makes it happen and yeah. you do a fantastic job and and we're going to have a conversation here very shortly amongst the leadership team probably this week yeah. and do a reevaluation of of what we of where we do going forward and we know the governor come out with you know some different things here but the supreme court also came out with a very nice thing <laughs> for us yes yeah. So anyways, uh, we'll be more on that soon. Mm-hmm. But but, uh, you know, we're in spiritual warfare. Yeah. You know, that's all I got to say, yeah. you know, and, and just keep, you know, keep putting that open your Bible, get yeah. in the Bible, listen to a great teaching this morning. We'll talk about that a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Yeah. And and we kind of did a, a cool new project this week um, and really harped on the fact that you can't close churches that don't have walls. Uh, so if yeah, you have exactly. seen on social media, um, we started this project with the, I mean, it, did we start, I don't even think we started it. I think literally some, some awesome people from the Shiloh Ranch community came up with this idea to cut and supply firewood here at the church for families or individuals who need it, um, to stay warm this winter. So that has been amazing. You've probably seen that on social media. If not, um, go back on our pages and check that out. So talk a little bit about that. So the firewood project was, uh, it was a brainstorm of a certain leader that we was have. It? Okay, yeah, good. it was, it was him. <laughs> and, uh, as usual, you can count on Jordan to, to be out in front of things. Yeah. And, and, but here's, here's what the good thing is. We have such an amazing group of men and and, uh, other people in the community yeah. that'll just step up and there uh i i seen the pictures i haven't been down to the pit yet but it is it is full yeah. and these guys work hard yeah. and so if somebody out here in the local community needs firewood if you need some in arizona we can probably uh <laughs> fix that too because you guys are so cold i'm sure <laughs> Oh gosh, that's great. So um, you're actually going to be seeing the uh, cool announcement video that the media team put together with Brandon Grindle. Um, After that, we'll be going into worship. So just as a reminder, if you can stand worship along with us, um, that's just, again, a physical physical step you can take to join us in worship. (coughs) So you can take it away. (laughs) Thank you very much. You know, Mary has a cold, but we're, uh, we're just going to slip right into this worship, and you'll find Mary is going to sing just fine. Thank you very much. Hey, everybody. Last week, Jordan reached out to me and told me that uh, he wanted to do a firewood project. The two goals for the winter, especially with everything going on with the shutdown and all that, is to keep people fed through the 1017 project and try and keep them warm. Um, As you can see behind me, we have small firewood storage right now. That was a culmination of three different people, one person donating the wood and two guys splitting it and transporting it. But we need more wood. Um, Our goal for this winter is to see this thing full and empty and full and empty. That means people are contributing and that means that other people are getting to benefit from it. So you can contact me directly. We'll link it into the video. And um, if you have logs, just raw logs, if you have rounds or if you have split wood, uh, we can make it work. And please don't hesitate to reach out if you're in need. Um, That's what we're trying to do is trying to help the community. Thanks so much.
declare that today. You are so good. God, we just thank you for this time of worship. God, we just ask for your presence in our lives. Just help us to remember in this season that you are so good. You are a good father. You are a good friend. And we can rely on you for everything we need. We love you and we praise you. Amen. I'm just imagining the conversation I would have had with my grandpa. If I would have said, Grandpa, you don't understand. It's 2020. Churches are shut down with in-person services. COVID is this thing that we didn't know existed. But here's the good news. People are finding meaningful church community online. I, I can hear it already. I know exactly what Jasper would say. He said it's not real church. <laughs> so as we're all on this journey together, one of the things that's been so cool is that there are people that live nowhere near a Shiloh Ranch campus that have found a home online. They come together. They are experiencing Jesus. They're experiencing culture and community, and they're giving. So here's what I want to encourage you to do. If you feel like that the mission of Shiloh is something that you feel called to, you can participate from literally anywhere, despite what Jasper Weaver may think. <laughs> uh, I love him. I can't wait to have this conversation with him in heaven. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You can send mail to PO Box 177, Powell Butte, Oregon, 97753. You can text the number 77977. It'll pop up on your screen somewhere. All one word, Shiloh Ranch. It'll take you to our giving platform. It's completely secure. We've used it for years. You can go to the app, Shiloh Ranch Church. You can go to the website. There is just a million ways to participate in where it is that we feel God's taken us, and we'd love for you to be a part of that. I'm back and better than ever. Did Excuse you listen to that, that beautiful voice? Oh, yeah, sing? I sing. I mean, she's amazing. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, anyways, uh, thanks for hanging in there. Uh, kind of put you on the spot there. I'm excited. I, I, I'm used to McLean's doing that, so I'm, <laughs> and I'm very good with it. Okay, yeah. I'm excited about today's sermon. One of my favorite guys ever, my dad. I guess he's Jacob's dad too, but who's his favorite child? It's up for debate. Not really, but... We're excited about that. Uh, he was, we were talking on Friday uh, and he said, you know what? I think I'm probably uh, holding the world record for the longest three-part sermon in Shiloh Ranch history because it's been about a span of three years. Uh, but he has talked about sharing your story or sharing your, sharing a meal, sharing your friends and sharing a story today is going to be the sermon. So um He's amazing. I love him. He's had a million jobs right now. He's a circuit court judge uh, in Crook in Jefferson County. So watch out in the courtroom, folks. <laughs> but if you want to talk a little bit about uh, the notes that he sent over and what he's going to be talking about, that'd be awesome. Well, I could just go on and on. We could do a lot about Mike <laughs> yeah. McLean. He's, uh, he's a great friend of mine, and, and he's going to be teaching in, in Mark today, Mark mm -hmm. 5, I believe. And uh, he always has a great story to tell. That's one of the things probably has drawn me to Mike as much as anything is he's just such a, a great person to sit down and yeah. visit and share life with. And he's uh, helped me out immensely in, in uh, over the years. Yeah. I hadn't heard from him for a while. And in a couple months, a month and a half ago, he called me out of the blue. And, and I'm going like, is this really you, Mike? <laughs> it made my day. So yeah. I hope that he makes your day. Uh, I know he's going to do an excellent job. I love the guy. And uh, I look forward to this. Yeah. yeah so take notes. Um, you know that he'll be talking about Mark 5. So just open up your Bibles, uh, whether it's an actual Bible or on your phone, because that's basically what I do is just everything on my phone. Now open up to Mark 5. Get ready to take some notes. We're excited. After the sermon, we're going to be going straight into worship. So again, if you can stand and worship along with us, that'd be great. Well, we'll see if Mike, you know, he usually uses my name in his sermons yeah. to, to kind of get him a bump. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. Oh, it'll be great. All right. Is that all? Fantastic. That's all. Let's keep do sharing. It. Keep sharing as we start the sermon. Uh, just keep sharing the stream so more people can have access to it. And uh, Levi and I will be back after the sermon and after worship. Well, thank you. Um, I really appreciate the warm welcome. Uh, my name is Mike McLean, and uh, I get to be a part of uh, the little team here at Shiloh Ranch that teaches, and it's been a little bit for me. Um, I had a little hiatus, but uh, I'm back, and uh, you know, uh, thank you for the vote uh, of fan favorite. I appreciate that. It's a wonderful award. Um, but today I wanted to uh, uh, first uh, hope all of you had a wonderful Thanksgiving, 
and uh, we have a lot to be thankful for. There are times that are difficult, and this is one of them. But uh, I know all of you are enjoying time with your family and getting to remember the things that make us grateful. And that, in, in and of itself, frankly, is, is a very good thing. But today, uh, I wanted to uh, talk about sharing your story. Now, back in July of 2018, I uh, had a, uh, a, a talk that was called um, uh, Sharing a Meal. And uh, then in September of 2018, uh, we talked about uh, sharing your friends uh, with each other. But today, I wanted to complete that three-part series. Um, actually, it's not a three-part series, but at any event, it's the longest three-part series in the history of sermons, at least at Shiloh, but sharing your story. And it really, for me, is very meaningful because it's part of my story. And I look at this passage in the Gospel of Mark, and it's fascination, uh, or it's fascinating to me because it has multiple layers. And uh, so, uh, and we also see what happens when one guy shares his story of what God has done for him, and it um, really impacts in whole area. So if you have your Bible there, uh, turn to, uh, it's Mark chapter 5. five. So I'm just going to read it, uh, first 20 verses, it'd be a little bit, but They came to the other side of the sea. So it's talking about the Sea of Galilee, and it's Jesus in his disciples. And uh, they came to the other side of the sea, to the county of uh, Gerasenes, or what's also called the Gadarenes. And when Jesus stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart and broke the shackles into pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him, or as another passage said, no one had the strength to tame him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he would always cry out and he would cut himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him, and crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of this man, you unclean spirit. Meaning Jesus was. And, um, And Jesus asked him, What is your name? And this, this guy said, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him to uh, earnestly not to send him into the country. Now, a great herd of pigs was feeding on the hillside, and they began to say to Jesus, Send us into the pigs, let us enter them. So Jesus gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. And the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned into the sea. Now, the herdsmen fled and told folks in the city and in the country. So word got out about what happened. And the people came to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw that the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion, sitting there, and he was clothed in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who had seen it described it to them and what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. And as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim and uh, Decapolis, excuse me, it's Decapolis, how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. Now, that is a long passage from Mark, but it's always interests me because it has all these things going on, and it's kind of a weird story. Um, and uh, But I wanted to talk today about the passage towards the end where the guy wants to come and be with Jesus. But Jesus said, no, go home and tell your friends what God has done for you. And 
Now, the culture that this guy belonged to was not a Jewish culture. The irony is that this was a Gentile uh, area. This, if you go across the Sea of Galilee, for, uh, Galilee um, or what they called the uh, Lake Tiberias, but um, you know, you have on the west side of the Sea of Galilee, you know, Canaan, and you know where the famous wedding took place, and uh, where Jesus changed water into wine. He grew up in Nazareth, Nazareth, which was on the west side, on, toward the north. Well, on the east side, towards the south, the southeast side of the lake there was this area of 10 towns or what they call 10 cities, Decapolis. And they were Hellenistic in culture. So they were Greek. They had been established there during the Alexander the Great area and they held to Greek traditions. And so they were considered Gentiles. And a lot of their culture was very uh, focused on the Greek traditions. So they weren't Jewish and they were very suspicious of people who perform miracles because, you know, they, they sort of put things in boxes where a little, um, you know, logic was at a premium. And uh, they did not like, you know, traveling preachers and, and they, were, they, they didn't believe in miracles, frankly. Uh, in Wikipedia, it says um, about uh, Decapolis that, it's not that they were bound by political alliance, these towns, but they were bound by culture. They stuck to themselves. So they reacted to this idea that Jesus was a Messiah or that miracles were possible. They reacted with a little bit of like, you know, we don't want any part of it. And then when they were told, they were confronted with that a miracle occurred, they were a little bit afraid kind of rocked their world a bit. And their reaction to Jesus at the time was, leave. Uh, you know what? Um, hit the road, Jack. It is not stuff that we want to be around. So, but interesting in the Gospel of Mark, uh, a couple chapters later, Jesus comes back to this region. Now, I'm not sure how much later. It, 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 it's in the scripture, a couple of chapters. But he comes back to this region Mark chapter 7, verse 31 to 37. And he gets a very different reaction from the people, from this culture, and from the town. It, it, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's, an, it's an interesting illustration about how one man's story changes a whole area. So, Mark chapter 7, verse 31. Then he returns, speaking of Jesus, from the region of Tyre, and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee, to the region of Decapolis. So again, Jesus comes back, it's later. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment, and they begged him to lay hands on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers in his ears, and after spitting, touched his tongue, and he looked up to heaven and sighed and said to him, Ephatha, which means be open. And his ears were open and his tongue was released and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying he has done all things well. He has even made the deaf hear and the mute to speak. Now, my point of this story, of this second thing, what really fascinated me, not that Jesus healed a, a guy who couldn't hear, and then Jesus healed through spitting on somebody, but that's another story. But his point is, when Jesus came back, the folks from the same culture, the same area, suddenly are bringing out a deaf guy to be healed. And they received Jesus. They marveled at him. They were bragging about him. They were encouraged by him. So one guy going and telling his story about what God did for him in to this area of 10 cities had the effect of changing the whole area where people suddenly went from, I don't want anything to do with Jesus to, boy, I'm open to Jesus, to like, Jesus, please help me. Because one guy told his story. I mean, it's a, it's, you know, it's kind of a hidden little message in 
the Gospel of Mark, but I think it's fascinating. One Bible commentary described it this way. The demon-possessed man who was cured by Jesus spread the news of the healing to the other cities of the Decapolis. People in these Gentile cities often feared miracle workers as some sort of magicians. So word of mouth might possibly calm their misunderstandings. No rejection of Jesus is reported when he himself traveled through Decapolis region later. What an interesting note in a Bible commentary. One guy going to his friends and just telling his story. This is what's happened to me. This is my story. And suddenly it changed a whole area. We see, you know, throughout the Bible, in the Old Testament, for an example, in Daniel chapter four, verse two, the author wrote, it has seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the most high God has done for me. In first Chronicles 16, eight, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. In the New Testament, Peter, of course, you know, Peter was uh, one of the disciples of Jesus. And later on, after Jesus ascended into heaven, Peter was a leader of the church and he wrote a letter. And um, the church fathers eventually put that in the New Testament. But it's 1 Peter 3.15. This is what he said. But in your hearts, revere God. Christ is Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. And I, I, I love that thought that, you know what? If you live your life, eventually someone's going to ask you to tell your story. And sometimes people want to know, why you have hope in the midst of a pandemic, why you have hope in the midst of divisive times, why you have hope when tragedy strikes. Why do you have hope? People want to know because there's something about your story that touches them. And Peter put it this way, be ready to tell them, but do so with gentleness and respect. I love that. In Acts chapter 22 and 26, if you know, Paul told his story in about 500 words. St. Paul, the great um, apostle, and it takes about two, three minutes to read it. He told his story, but we're not talking long. He shared with it. Jesus said this right before his ascension in the book of Acts. One of the last things. In fact, it may be the last thing that was recorded that he said to his disciples and followers. He said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And I've always been interested in that because what does it mean to be you will be my witnesses? And um, well, I'm. Look, if you spend as, uh, as much time as I do in a courtroom, um, it, this makes total sense because you have advocates and somebody calls a witness, a witness for the defense, a witness for the prosecution, for the plaintiff, for the defense. In other words, who is the witness? And you come to the stand. If you're a witness and you're called to the stand, it's pretty simple. You basically say, well, this is who I am, my name. And I'm telling you the truth. So please, you know, this is my story. And then you're asked, well, tell us what happened. What did you see? What did you observe? What impact did it have on you? See, to be a witness is to be somebody who tells a story that someone else wants to hear. And I think when Jesus said, you're going to be my witnesses all over the earth, what he's saying is, you know what? You're going to tell your story. And that in and of itself is going to have an impact everywhere. And I mean, talk about a strategy. I mean, you could critique him and say, listen, there's got to be a media plan. There's got to be some sort of, you know, we got to have a journal. We got to have a printing press. Certainly we got to have, you know, marketing guys, ad guys. But his strategy, if you will, 
uh, to have an impact all over the world was to send out people to say, eh, tell them your story. Tell them your story of what God has done in your life. And it worked. It changed the world. Cultures all over the world recognize the power when you tell your story. In fact, in Australia, I love this quote, but it comes from a, a reachout.com, but it's an Australian uh, entity that helps young people with mental health. And I love this quote. It says, ever listen to someone talk about their life and thought, oh, someone else has been through that too. I thought it was just me. Finding similarities with other people helps us live happy and healthy lives. Your life may feel extraordinary. Well, no, let me say, let me uh, reread it. Your life may feel ordinary to you, but it might seem extraordinary to someone else. Every story shared is a chance to make someone feel less alone. I love that last phrase, especially when we're isolated, either by choice or by regulations or by a pandemic or something. People need to feel connected. They need to hear your story. You're giving someone a gift when you're telling a story. On Thanksgiving, just a few days ago, I was reading the Oregonian and I read a story about my high school football coach who later, uh, who was a great encouragement to me when I was in high school, Condon High School, and named Jim Carey. The name of the article is Redemption, Love, and Acceptance comes 45 years after two brothers graduate from high school. And it's a story about how Jim Carey, uh, who later moved on and, and uh, uh, worked for Estacada School District, but how he connected people from his high school of Woodland, Washington, and specifically the love that was able to be shared by a guy who was alienated uh, in high school and, and connect to his brother before he died. It's a wonderful story. It's a very encouraging story. And I read about that uh, just on Thanksgiving and I thought, wow, that story connects with me. And it encourages me to say, you know what? Don't lose track of those friends from high school. There's beauty still in those relationships that you've had in decades past. past. I'm glad Jim and the others were willing to share their story. Now, I was told one time something that um, really impacted me. And it said, people really don't care how much you know. They want to know how much you care. People want a connection more than they want information. And when you share your story, you're allowing them to connect to your life and you're giving them. You're giving them something from you that they can't argue with. You know, when you talk politics, when you talk philosophy or maybe something that has logic to it and you're trying to defend it, you know, you invite some sort of argument inevitably because people can always argue politics and they can dispute your logic and they can debate philosophy, but no one can argue or debate your story because it's your story. It's what you've experienced. And they either have to sort of accept it or just reject it. But to argue against it isn't really an option because it's what you experience. There's beauty into a story because it, it's like a parable in a way. It, it has layers, even layers that you may not see in your own story. And connections in hearts that God the Creator made. And maybe he wants to connect some dots with people because ultimately we see ourselves. Now, I bring up a lot of this because it's part of my story. Um, how I came to be fascinated with the scriptures and layers uh, and seeing things and, and uh, stories. Because I myself, uh, you know, it's hard for my kids to believe, but I was young once. And um, when I was 25... I heard a speaker who was fantastic and, and had a way of teaching the scripture that really gave me, I don't know, just kind of opened my eyes. I just thought, wow, I'd never seen that before. And I was telling this uh, mentor friend of mine and I said, boy, I, I, I want to discover um, the, that depth of the Bible like this guy taught. You know, should I go to Bible school? Should I go to, you know, take a class or what should I do? 
And he kind of smiled and said, no, 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 you don't need to do anything that I'll tell you what, I'll introduce you to a friend of mine. And he introduced me to Kelly Kanegi. Now, I, I brought up Kelly before when I taught, but this guy was 80 at the time. I was 25. He was uh, retired. He had been a preacher part time for Mennonite church and also a farmer, raised pigs for a time, had a tree farm. But he had a childlike joy in the scriptures and telling the stories of the scriptures. And he met with me and I sat with him for three, four years and going through the scriptures together. But he gave me a, a, a way to look at things. Uh, it, it was called the second bone. Now I'll say it again because not everyone has heard that story and, and I've shared it before, and, uh, but permit me to share it again. So the story of the second bone, Kelly Kanegi told me this, he said, Look, there was this college professor who was notified one day from a uh, lawyer in North Carolina that his uncle had died and his uncle had left him a farm. He was the only heir. And so he went down to North Carolina to, you know, settle matters on the state. And the lawyer said, look, your uncle was a wealthy guy. He didn't have heirs. He didn't spend a lot of money. He made a lot of money investments. But before he passed, he liquidated his investments and bought you know, precious stones, diamonds, gold coins. And he put it somewhere on this farm. Uh, and it's millions of dollars. And, uh, you know, back in the 50s or so, that was, you know, that's real money today. And it, well, it was a fortune. And so this guy, he, he said, we don't know where he buried it. We're not sure where it is, but it's there. And so the professor uh, searched and he found in the attic, he noticed that there was some, new paint and so he took a crowbar and tapped along kind of a rafter and then saw that there was sort of a little false uh paneling and pulled it out and out dropped you know some gold coins and uh some precious stones and he thought oh my gosh you know and so he gathered it up went in well, the lawyer said, look, this is worth, I mean, $25,000, but that's not the real wealth that there, there's more there. So that night the professor was barbecuing, it was by himself and he was caring for his uncle's old dog. Um, and he gave the dog a steak bone, had a, quite a lot of meat on it. The dog ate on it for a while, but then buried it deep into a hole, uh, put the bone uh, down and they buried it. Then went and got kind of a dried up bone and then went in the same hole and buried it only a little ways down. And the professor said, that is incredibly strange, but you know, it's North Carolina. And he's watching it and pretty soon a neighbor dog comes along sniffing and the dog discovers the hole where the bone's buried. And he digs down, he grabs the first bone and takes off. Well, the old dog just didn't do much. And the college professor went, oh, wow, the second bone, that's where the real treasure is. And then he went, wait a second. So he goes back up to the attic and he started to drill through in that same hole. And he decided to take apart, in essence, the, in essence, the rafters in the attic. And of course, that's where all the treasure was hidden, was he had specifically rebuilt the roof and hid in the rafters millions of dollars of treasures. And so what Kelly had said to me, look, the scriptures like that. There's first bone, which is good, but the second bone is where the real meat is. And you have to keep digging in the same spot. You have to keep pressing for the second bone, see things that perhaps you didn't see the first time. We looked at a passage where he was showing me uh, the second bone and it was the passage of this guy who had legion in him. And not only did we talk about the act of his sharing his story, but when I asked him specifically, what do you think is the second bone in this passage? Um, we talked about it. And this is part of my story about my fascination with the scripture. But Kelly said, well, look at this. Look at the word for tomb. He said, you, you see in this passage where a man lived, he lived among the tombs. He cried out from the tombs. That word tomb is Minoian in the Greek, and it means a remembrance. In essence, what's in your memory? And um, 
we see tombs are like a visible object for preserving or recalling the memory of a person. So, and he said, look, there are forces. There are memories that you have and that bother you, that cry out, that antagonize, that have a darkness to them. And like the people in that region, they try to bind it, get it out of there, control it, and it doesn't work. Then they try to subdue it, or what the Greek says in Damaso, called to tame, or in essence to, how do we get it to at least let us be? That doesn't work either. But it keeps crying out. And as Kelly said, well, maybe, maybe what Jesus is doing here, and we can see by looking at it a different way, another layer to the story, is that he's saying, hey, look, there may be in your memory something in your past that haunts you, something that troubles you, something that's a darkness. And, and you've tried to get rid of it. You've tried to tame it. And nothing you do will get it to let you be. But Jesus comes and suddenly everything changes. In essence, Jesus not only heals the present, he heals the past. He restores the soul. He brings peace to the memory because the man was later found to be in relationship. So it's not like the memory's gone, but the memory's healed. Maybe that's the second bone. For me, it really opened my eyes to say, oh my gosh, I see Jesus at a deeper level here in this story because of the second bone. He is the healer of the present and he's the healer of the past. He not only deals with my struggles, he deals with my soul in the darkness that can haunt us from the mistakes we've made and the trauma we've experienced. That is why, for me, I loved learning the scripture is to be able to see stories in a different way. And so that's part of my story. And I thought I'd share it with you because there may be someone out there who's asked a question. Is there more to the Bible? And maybe in my story, you might find that, oh my gosh, there is. There is more to the Bible. There are layers. There's second bones to the Bibles. There could be someone out there who is experiencing something in their journey toward God that connects with your story. And by giving them your story, it's really an act of love. It's really a way in which you're sharing with them a part of your heart and you're being willing to invite them to understand you at a deeper level just by sharing your story. God could use that to connect to them because ultimately, as Peter recognized, people want to know, why are you hopeful? Why do you believe in ultimately a restoration, a beauty when so often what we see is harshness. And by just simply saying, look, this is what's happened to me. All I can tell you is what I've experienced and this is what's happened to me. That in and of itself is an act of love. And God uses those little acts of love, those little selfless acts to weave together a beautiful orchestra, a beautiful array a beauty in the midst of hardship. Now, I love the scriptures because of those things, because there are beautiful layers, deeper meanings, second bone. And we are all a part of a larger story. Remember that. I mean, his story, God's story, his story is history. And we're all a part of it. By sharing your story of what God's done in your life, you get to have a way to invite someone else to a more meaningful, encouraging walk with God. And if nothing else, as recognized by that group in Australia, you're at least telling people they're not alone. And that is important. Now, I'd sum it up this way. Jesus did three things and encouraged us to do three things. Um, he encouraged us to share a meal. Even now we can share a meal with folks 
to share your friends. And as I've said before, that I've always been impacted by the phrase that if you really are impressed with someone and you, you think what they're doing is incredibly important, you'll give them money, maybe your time. But if you love someone, you'll give them your friends. Sharing your friends is a huge and important way in which we celebrate what God has done for us. And then finally, sharing your story. It's simple. You know, when you're a witness, all you do is say, this is what I've seen. This is what I've experienced. Believe it or not, this is who I am. And that is what God has designed as the great strategy, if you will, uh, to let a world know there's hope. So I hope you have enjoyed this Thanksgiving uh, weekend and our friends all over uh, America, both in Arizona and Oregon and Texas and wherever you are, I want to say you're not alone uh, and we get to have time together to listen to each other's stories and to encourage it. And I look forward to that as we head into the Christmas season. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for giving us your wonderful scriptures and for giving us, giving us this chance to be together, to connect, whether it be all online or in person or however we do it, to connect with each other and to know there is beauty, wonderful encouragement in the midst of even difficult times like this. But I know you hear our hearts and you answer our prayers still today. And so we ask that you would connect us and encourage us. And we do pray for the United States of America, God. We pray that you would give our land peace and you would help all of us to encourage one another to move forward in our relationship with you. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.
we just exalt you today. God, we lift you up to the highest praise because of what you've done for us. God, the sacrifices that you make. We just thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy that sets us free every single day. God, help us to lift you up in praise every morning and every evening. We're back. I'm back. Levi, how was your Thanksgiving? It was fantastic. I'm glad. Yeah, very restful. I'm glad. Full of thanks. Oh. Uh, yeah. I bet your family is a fun one to spend Thanksgiving with. It is. I'll yeah. be there next year. Yeah. Okay. okay. Sure. Cool. Uh, we have reached the end of another awesome service. Thank you guys so much for being here, whether it's online, in Wickenburg, at your house, in your car, wherever. Um, thanks for being with us. Talk about prayer. Um, if you have any prayer requests, don't hesitate to comment on the stream, private message us, or email administrator at shilohranch.com, and we will get back to you and send those to our prayer team. Yeah, I think we also have prayer at shilohranch.com is another email. Um, comment, someone comment if that's not right. But I think prayer at shilohranch.com is another email. Um, yeah, so... Again, just keep uh, checking back on Facebook for more updates. Download the app um, for more updates as well. If you know someone who isn't on social media or hasn't downloaded the app yet, uh, definitely reach out to them and help them get set up um, to receive those notifications so that they know what's going on. Um, as Robert kind of said, they're, you know, the leadership team, Jordan and Lacey, they're all meeting together and kind of just trying to figure out moving forward what we're going to do. Um, so check back on Facebook, on the app. Um, last thing also is if you're in Wickenburg, stick around after the, ser the service. Um, and Mark and Jordan are going to be talking to you guys a little bit. I think that's it. That's it. Yeah. I think that's it. So um, take what you heard during the sermon this week. Be nice to people. Share your story. Give people hope. Give people peace. Um, run from bad guys. We had a teacher in high school that would always end his classes yep. with, be nice to people, run from bad guys. Yep. So that's all we have to say. Have um, a good weekend. Have a, well, it's the end of the well, weekend. The rest of your weekend. Have a great rest yeah. of your Sunday. Have a great week. Um, and yeah, thanks for watching. Continue to share. Everything will be available on our Facebook page and our YouTube page afterwards. And uh I don't know. I don't want to end. I just kind of want to hang out here for another oh, hour. This is so. awkward. You and I can just talk. Okay. So we have flying things in the studio. You guys, thanks for being here. We love you so much. We'll see you again next week. Bye. See you later. <laughs>